World Corrupt is brought to you by Tommy John. Fall, I'm, I'm supposed to say, Raj, is chaos in your pants. <laughs> Oh, I meant to say you can say that again, even though I dread hearing you say those words again. You're overheating one second, you're freezing the next. Yes. To be ready for anything, you need underwear that can handle everything. It's, <laughs> oh boy, it's time for Tommy John underwear. In Tommy John underwear, you're that much more comfortable, so you can do everything better. Name a problem with the other underwear, and Tommy John solved it. That's the chaos in the pants I look for. <laughs> and just look how it's revitalized the career of so many major league pitchers. <laughs> But unlike the ulnar collateral <laughs> ligament reconstruction surgery, this is a journey. The underwear is breathable and made from lightweight fabric that has four times the stretch of competing brands. They come with a no wedgie guarantee, thanks to a non-rolling waistband and legs that never ride up, with over 17 million pairs sold. People love Tommy John underwear. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers, they have fanatics. Who doesn't love chaos in their pants, Tommy? I will say... <laughs> I have never been happier since I made the switch to Tommy John. As an Everton fan, underwear is a major part of the experience as we go through several pairs every 90 minutes. <laughs> go to tommyjohn.com slash world. Go right now and you get 20% off your first order. That's 20% off at tommyjohn.com slash world. tommyjohn.com slash world. See site for details. The winner to organize... The 222 FIFA World Cup is Qatar. 6,500 migrant workers have died in Qatar since it won its World Cup bid. That is devastating. Sports is always a bloody emotional release to joy, a refuge, a place we seek shelter from the storm of everyday life. How will we consume what is essentially a World Cup soaked in blood? Crooked Media's Tommy Vito. Men in Blazers, Roger Bennett. This is like one of those old crossover episodes when Scooby-Doo would team up with Batman and attempt to solve some caper. Surely there's only one way this can end. Us pulling off the mask of a frumpy old man, only to be reminded that he would have got away with it. If it wasn't for us pesky kids, Tommy. <laughs> See, I was thinking there was like, not since Full House met Family Matters have two audiences been this... Uh, confused, probably, if we're being honest. But, Raj, I am thrilled to do this series with you because it combines three of my passions. Sports, foreign policy, and feeling guilty. And all it took for us to actually do this pod was really for the world to go to crap. Mm -hmm. A total confluence of terrifying forces. So terrifying, they're threatening to destroy one of the single things that we love the most, which is sports in general, as you say and the World Cup in particular, the crown jewel of the sport. This time round, it's going to be in Qatar. Yes, a nation state that was awarded the sport's most coveted competition corruptly and then proceeded to build the infrastructure for the tournament with migrant labour practices that have been likened to modern slavery. So why is this happening? What makes F1 Golf, the World Cup, so bloody attractive to despots and deviants. To be honest, Raj, the, the answer is kind of complicated. Uh, and what you believe probably depends on your perspective. You and I ha have learned a lot since we started working on this podcast and reporting it out several months ago, including about some of our own biases. And we want to bring you guys, the audience, with us along that journey. Oh, when I hear the word journey, I think it's all going to end with you and me doing ayahuasca with Aaron Rodgers in the <laughs> desert somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned, Raj. Maybe it's a bonus episode. But to answer your question... Um, It'd be seven, so seven hours, 29 <laughs> minutes. Special bonus. <laughs> so you uh, get Joe Rogan involved, this could be a hit. Um, some experts out there argue that, look, it, vanity is the reason all these golf autocrats want to buy football clubs. You know, they have massive amounts of money. They have even bigger egos. And, and they're competitive. And so you might view Qatar's motivation for wanting to host the World Cup as just an effort to throw itself kind of a, a global coming out party. You know, they want to show that Qatar is open for business and they want to compete with their more cosmopolitan neighbors in Dubai. Oh, Dubai, that massive modern city in the neighboring United Arab Emirates that went from small desert town to home of literally the tallest building in the world within about 50 years. Amazingly, yes, exactly. 
And that same UAE has invested huge money into soccer powerhouses like Manchester City, their neighbours in Saudi Arabia just followed suit last year when they brought their own English Premier League club called Newcastle. Starts to kind of feel like a global pitch measuring contest if you get my drift. I like what you did there, Tommy. Actually, I'll take that back. I hate what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> I hate what I did there too. But listen, hosting the World Cup also gives Qatar a reason to spend big money on infrastructure projects that they need. Subways, stadiums, hotels. It helps them attract Western companies and investment. There are some clear practical benefits too. You're a very practical man, but we've got to be honest. So many of the activists and human rights groups that we've spent time talking to over the past few months had a much darker view of Qatar's motives. You're right, they did. They view Qatar's 2022 bid as above all else, just a, a global PR campaign to sell a more modern image to the world and to connect Qatar with the glamorous and glitzy world of international football and not the you know darker corners of their human rights and foreign policy record. AKA sports washing. The term we're gonna introduce you to that you're gonna hate, it's when an individual or a state uses sports to burnish their reputation or frankly, hide their sins. It doesn't matter if you're a Russian oligarch or an authoritarian country. Buying a team or hosting a major sporting event is an easy way to get everybody talking about what's happening on the field instead of your problems off of it. The term is relatively new, but the concept has been around for a long time. The most infamous example is when Hitler's Germany hosted the 1936 Olympic Games. Hitler wanted to show the world the superiority of Nazi Germany in the Aryan race, and that is, of course, until a black American man named Jesse Owens won four gold medals and humiliated him in front of the world. And for that, Jesse, we thank you for eternity. But you could really argue, Raj, that the concept goes back much further, like the bread and circuses in ancient Rome. The reality is we've all got to check our moral compasses. How we consume and revel in these things we love, honestly, more than love, that we live for, and not at least tangentially be complicit in all of the undercurrents that operate below the surface just bubbling away. John Oliver, he comes on our show every single year, and I believe he's our most repeat guest ever, actually. Massive, massive Liverpool fan. Football really means everything to that gent. He and I were talking about how he's going to approach the World Cup in Qatar in November, and he explained so bloody eloquently the question this all distills down to. There has never been anything more complicated than balancing your love for the World Cup with the organisation that produces it, right? Uh, we've all, all felt that. We, we did, we've done two stories on our show about FIFA, and, which often end with, and I'm still going to watch it. But yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, FIFA is an international crime syndicate, but I'm, I, I love the thing they produced so much. <laughs> I guess the really brutal honesty is that I'm probably going to watch and enjoy a World Cup that shouldn't be happening there. I, I don't know what that says about me as a human being, but it's not great. I probably don't have the strength in me not to watch what is normally my absolute favorite thing in the world that I look forward to watching for exactly four years. Truthfully, like, look, I focus on politics, I talk about international affairs, but on my foreign policy show, Ben and I talk about sports nearly every week. And it's not just because we're addicts like you, it's because sports and politics and culture constantly overlap, right? I mean, too often in the US, that overlap is political leaders trying to tell athletes, usually black athletes, that they should be quiet, right? They're denounced for kneeling during the national anthem. You have Fox News host Laura Ingram infamously telling LeBron James this. No one voted for you. Millions elected Trump to be their coach. So keep the political commentary to yourself, or as someone once said, shut up and dribble. The suggestion that sports used to be some safe space away from political debates in the US or anywhere else is just absurd. I mean, look at Jim Brown, look at Jackie Robinson, what they did to break racial barriers in this country and fight for racial justice. Martina Navratilova, the WNBA star Brittany Griner, who's currently being detained in Russia, fought for LGBT rights. Venus and Serena Williams demanded gender and pay equity. Bill Russell, Muhammad Ali, right? Athletes have run for office. It is no different internationally. Football is that almost times 100 because 
it's a global game that's inextricably linked to politics. And I've always said, honestly, ultimately, it's what draws me to it. When international football and when World Cups take place, you have two teams taking the field and their histories, their cultures, their economies, their politics, they take the field alongside them. I've always said football is just a mirror that refracts what's happening to society back to the world. Tommy, we've talked about this when you had the terrible taste to allow me onto Pod <laughs> Save the World. You got rid of that producer that allowed me on. I knew from the glimmer in the Tommy VI, I knew that football was beginning to speak to you. And I actually, I need to say this before we dive in. Some people would say I did you dirty because <laughs> I convinced you to support Trademark, the greatest football club in the world, a.k.a. Everton Football Club, my hometown sure team did. from Liverpool, that once great port city in the northwest of England. Think Baltimore of Great Britain, British charm city. And for those of you listening who may not be massive Premier League fans, you could be asking yourself, wait, aren't Liverpool the team from Liverpool? And it's true. It's a bit like the Yankees, Liverpool, the Mets or Everton, the Clippers to Los Angeles Lakers or the Roger Clinton to Liverpool's bill, but I prefer to think of them <laughs> as a team that runs on heart, on sure. emotion. Tell me if you've experienced it as a new bloop. I'm new to this game. I, I did notice we recently lost to an MLS team in America. <laughs> we, we do a lot of good work for charity. I'm guessing that's not good. So listen, truthfully, Raj, I've wanted to get into football, into soccer for a very long time. So when you came on, I demanded that Raj act as my soccer <laughs> sommelier and help me pick a club. And now correct me if I'm wrong, Raj, but I think... You know, you knew I grew up near Boston as a Red Sox fan. I think you picked up on some some pining for the pre-2004 lovable loser Red Sox teams, maybe a, a wisp of self-loathing and desperation. Yes. More than a wisp, Thomas. A there was a willingness to wallow in melancholy. Yes, a propensity for self-sabotage. And then you yes. thought, Everton man. Welcome to Everton Football Club, <laughs> Thomas V. But even if they don't win much, look, the games are so much fun to watch. I watch every week. We even beat Chelsea this year. That's a big deal, right? One of the best clubs in the world. It was. I think Tommy is very keen. Thought about getting an Everton tramp stamp, which I warned him <laughs> off. But he gets on Twitter and is just like, whatever team we're about to play, being like, Chelsea, we proper hate them. I'm like, Tommy, no, no, no. Just, just pace yourself, pace yourself, lad. But what is amazing about football, growing up in Liverpool, my city, we consumed our football back in those days by going live to watch our local club in their grubby home stadium. We'd cram into drafty, rainy stands, which stank of sweat and spilt beer, body odor and police horse turd, <laughs> all the elements. And we watched the team that you love. They just huff and puff on a muddy pitch. These were I'd use the word like athlete slightly loosely. They were really men who just kicked each other slumly for 45 minutes <laughs> and then retreated into the locker room for a pie, a pint, a cigarette. And you were guaranteed that some oversized fan behind you would roll up their stadium program, just pee through it onto the back of your leg. It was like, oh, you feel that warmth. You'd be like, what is that? Oh, God, proper football. But the first time international football truly captured my imagination I was seven, I think World Cup 1978 was on television. It was held in Argentina. Argentina. Which felt like, honestly, the other side of the moon. And I know people listening, you know, we live in an era where we can not only watch any highlight from any league in the world on our phone, it gets pumped into us. And you will not believe this, but when I grew up as a kid in England, Live televised sports of any type was just an incredible rarity in late 1970s. Honestly, we'd only just bloody invented electricity uh, in our <laughs> neck of the woods. And so, seeing footballers from other parts of the world was just something that never happened. And this was mesmerizing. Honestly, it's one of my earliest memories. It's one of my most poignant memories. It's one of my most technical memories. And from that point on, the World Cup was the joy of my life, as it was for John Oliver. I mean, look, my first World Cup memory, the first time it came into my field of view was 1994, when the World oh. Cup was in the United States. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Star Spangled Banner Award winner, Peggy Hughes! Peggy Hughes! Peggy Hughes! Peggy Hughes! Peggy Hughes! Peggy Hughes! Yes! I actually got to go to a game, Raj. I was 14 years old, same haircut, then as now, I call it the Mitt Romney. <laughs> 
<laughs> you take a photo of Mitt Romney into the bar, bro, or is that just happen naturally? I say, I want this. Mine is the salt and pepper. It was Italy, Nigeria <laughs> at Foxborough this? Stadium in Boston, which I don't mind saying is where the New England Patriots went on to dominate the NFL for the next decade. But I remember it being a thousand degrees. We were all rooting for Nigeria because they were the underdog. And when you know nothing about a game, you root for the underdog, right? I rewatched some of that game the other day on YouTube and it came back to me. And so Nigeria was up a goal. The Italians got a red card, but they still managed to come back and win. It was in a hell of a game, but you know what was truly masterful was Roberto Baggio's rat tail. Do you remember this? You're talking about the Italian yes. maestro, a Buddhist footballer who was known as the divine ponytail. You're telling me that Tommy left that game and just turned around to the barber and said, I need a rat tail and I need it now. Begged my mother to let me get a rat tail. She, in her <laughs> infinite wisdom, said no. Thank you, mom. I love you forever. <laughs> Tommy, I think in 1994, I was already bald. And even as a bald man, I tried to grow a rat tail. Clip on? God, you know what? That's an incredible business idea. I'm going to make a note to self about that. Clip on <laughs> rat tails for the modern bald man. But I just arrived in the U.S., and this was really my first face-to-face -face with American football culture, American soccer culture for the first time. We joke on our show that soccer is America's sport of the future as it has been since 1972. <laughs> and to witness that culture for the first time, when the face of the game here was a gent named Alexi Lalas. Bloke's ginger goatee clashed beautifully with the American team's stonewashed denim uniforms. I crap you not. And I realized, God, this sport that I love could truly possibly flourish in the nation I adore. Don't take it from me. Let's listen to the legendary American sportscaster Jim McKay who delivered this point speech from his perch high above the 1994 World Cup final at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. So how does it add up in the end? Well, I've been impressed in this World Cup as much by the things that haven't happened as the things that have. It hasn't been a bomb as its attractors predicted in advance, nor have visiting fans spread violence from coast to coast. It has been simply the most successful World Cup ever staged in attendance and worldwide interest. On American TV, ratings have exceeded predictions by far, and the games have been marvelous. America has been at its best in welcoming the world, and we hope they'll come again soon. 1994, it's true, Jim was a World Cup of true wonder one we both remember fondly. And that's the beauty of this competition. It can be both one's own, deeply, personally, individualized, but it's also shared with millions of people, not just in your family or your town or your neighborhood. It truly is a World Cup, a month of Super Bowls, a four-week-long soccer theme bar mitzvah that unites the world who save every goal, every tackle, every ill-judged neck tattoo. And Tommy Vito, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? World Corrupt is brought to you by Athletic Greens, a product I literally use every day, including today, by the way. I started taking AG1 because, look, I wanted a better gut health I want a little more energy, Raj, and I wanted a better way to start my day. I just love the name. Tom Brady, TB12, Cristiano Ronaldo, CR7, Athletic Greens, AG1. And with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced ingredients, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This Special blend of ingredients supports gut health, it supports your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. <laughs> All the things, <laughs> it's lifestyle friendly, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, dairy free, and gluten free. Kosher. I didn't know that. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash world. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash world to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So the 2018 FIFA World Cup, 2018 FIFA World Cup, ladies and gentlemen, will be organized in Russia. All right, the gent you just heard 
was the president of FIFA, the then president of FIFA, the organization that runs the World Cup. His name, Sepp Blatter. This was back in 2010. And that announcement proper pissed me off. England was meant to get that 2018 World Cup, but I was still, I remember, still confident, even amidst my confusion, that 2022 was coming to the nation I love, the United States. And I had it on good authority. We'd actually secured hosting duties. And shortly after, Blatter stepped up to the microphone again. The winner to organize the 2022 FIFA World Cup is Qatar. Qatar? You're taking the piss. Bloody Qatar. Now, what? Tell me. I am a grown man. And I've got to be honest. In this moment, I almost soiled myself. This tournament, well, first of all, it was meant to be coming to America, but even setting my American bias aside for one second, here's what I want to know. I am, as you know, no geopolitical expert, but even in that moment, I was like, Russia and Qatar, those would be certainly curious choices, I think most people would agree, for a tournament which is meant to be the world's most revered global sporting event. Yeah. Curious is certainly one way to describe it. Uh, crazy might be another. Okay, let's talk a little bit just about some background in each of these countries. I suspect that by now, listeners have a pretty good sense of what Russia is like under President Vladimir Putin. Putin has been waging this horrific war in Ukraine for months. He has killed tens of thousands of innocent people. He's driven millions more from their homes. And, you know, even back in Russia, I mean, Russian citizens who criticize the war or the government generally are literally thrown in prison for years. Russia is an autocracy, which means it's ruled by Vladimir Putin and his power is absolute. The country is also incredibly corrupt. Putin sits at the top of a corruption food chain, a corruption human centipede, Raj, if you will. His top advisors and this group of men around in this coterie of men called the oligarchs have extracted billions of dollars from the state and they use that money to do Putin bidding. Qatar is similar to Russia in that one man runs the show, the emir, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani. And both countries have substantial oil and gas deposits. It's going to be important here because it buys you a lot of influence. There's little to no room for dissent in either country. I mean, Putin's most prominent critic is a man named Alexei Navalny, and he has been poisoned, literally, and is currently rotting in a prison on completely made up charges. In Qatar, women's rights are severely limited. Same-sex relationships by men can be punished with jail time. But the biggest divide in the country is between the 10 or 11 percent of the country who are citizens and the millions of foreign workers who actually built the place. Now, you know, even Qatari citizens have very few civil liberties or political rights. The media is censored. Citizens have basically no say in government decisions. But they do live a pretty comfortable life because of the state's oil and gas revenue. However, being a foreign worker in Qatar, your employer calls all the shots. There is rampant abuse of these workers, unpaid overtime, delayed wages, arbitrary deductions of pay, and these workers have almost no recourse. So you have young men in countries like Nigeria or Nepal or the Philippines going to debt, paying recruiters to help them find a job in Qatar in the first place. And then when they arrive, it is a nightmare. They're forced to live in squalid group homes. Their employers have all the leverage. They can even prevent them from leaving those jobs or returning home. And it's these foreign workers who are building the infrastructure that is required to put on a World Cup. And they're doing it in just horrifyingly dangerous conditions. It can reach up to 120 degrees in the summer in Qatar. And yet laws that are supposed to prevent construction workers, say, from laboring during the middle of the day are just routinely ignored. And those who complain publicly get arrested or even deported. So those are the, some of the reasons why Russia and Qatar have these bad reputations globally and get criticized by human rights groups and international organizations and would love to focus on soccer instead of themselves. And frankly, it's why FIFA should never have allowed them to host the games in the first place. Just listening to you, two things. First of all, I'm trying to repress the image of the human centipede of autocrats, which sounds like the worst emo band album of all time. <laughs> but the obvious question comes, how did the jewel of world football get to be played back to back under those conditions? In Qatar's case, in a country smaller than Connecticut, with that climate that you talk about, which is so unforgiving, that they had to lift the tournament from when it's meant to be played in the summer 
and just interrupt the whole football calendar around the world so they could dump it into the slightly cooler November and December. Well, Tommy V, turns out this is not a new story. And it's not even the first time that that amalgam of truckloads of cash and bribes and murderous regimes literally have coalesced to play benevolent host to your World Cup. We're in 1934 and Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, he was really sports washing before sports washing was on vogue. Tommy, just remind people, of Il Duce's place in history. Yeah, I'll keep this one real concise, Raj. He was bad news. (laughs) Mussolini (laughs) was the founder and leader of Italy's fascist party. He ran Italy as a dictatorship for years before deciding to join forces with the Nazis in World War II. It's safe to say that I'm not a fan. Also, a massive sports fan. Oh, no. And an opportunist who recognized one of the first gentlemen to realize football could be presented as a public relations platform around the globe, a catalyst for his brand of nationalism. And when the Italian team played at home, he enjoyed making a dramatic entrance onto the field. Picture Benito Mussolini, I crap you not, on a white horse. And when the Italian team traveled aboard, he instructed players to hold their fascist salutes until the whistling protesters in foreign nations had run out of their energy and could scream no more. And when his country hosted the World Cup in 1934. Travelling fans were first lured by offers to cover 75% of their travel costs. This is what Mussolini did. He gave them all these tickets, which were intricately paper-cutted because he kind of understood social media before there was social media or Instagram before there was Instagram. He made sure these tickets were printed on the finest quality paper so that people would go home and just show people the splendors of Italy. These Look at their tickets. Look, even their tickets are beautiful when they returned home. But Tommy, quickly, can you just remind us how all this worked out for Mussolini? Not well for Mussolini, well for the world. By 1945, things were going south for the Nazis, the Axis powers, and Mussolini and his girlfriend tried to escape. They tried to get to Spain before the Allied troops could find him. But he got captured near Lake Cuomo. I also, I say Lake Como like it's a New York governor, but you know, that's on me. Is it not named after Chris? <laughs> I think it might be. They loved Chris's show so much, they named the lake after it. They love when he uh, bench presses on Instagram. Um, <laughs> the US and the other allied powers, they wanted Mussolini detained. They wanted him tried for war crimes, but the folks he had been brutalizing in Italy had another idea. Uh, Mussolini was pretty quickly executed by firing squad, and his body was hung upside down and put on display in a public square. So not the best way to go. But that pattern that he kind of patented with the World Cup has played itself out over and over and over again. That 1978 World Cup that I talked about, the one that young Rog was so bloody excited, was mesmerized, it just burned itself into my retina. I was completely unaware of what was really happening because Tommy... I mean, you understand this even better than I do. 1978, Argentina, that dictatorial political climate. Brutal. I mean, in 1978, Argentinians were living under just a ruthless military dictatorship. It was led by a man named President Jorge Rafael Videla and a collection of military leaders who came to power in 1976 in a bloodless coup. But they were ultimately remembered for the brutal repression that swept the country and lasted during their entire time in power. I mean, they dissolved Congress. They censored the media. Dissent was essentially banned. And supporters of the former president or basically anyone accused of being a leftist or a communist or any kind of other dissenter was at serious risk of getting disappeared. Now, being disappeared could mean thrown in prison without charges. It could also mean murdered. I mean, people were literally thrown out of airplanes alive and left for the sharks in the ocean. Truly, truly horrifying stuff. There was also systematic torture. There was one notorious prison slash torture chamber that was so close to the World Cup stadium that you were watching on TV that prisoners could hear the crowd cheering from their cells. I mean, I can't imagine more of a nightmare. Also, Raj, look, which is being honest here, horrifyingly, America initially supported the government, along with many other dictators in South America, in the name of fighting communism. In fact, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger was President Videla's guest of honor at the World Cup. After it was all done, 
He did a bunch of interviews and he sung Argentina's praises. It's just a disgusting part of our history we need to reckon with. So Kissinger is a big, big soccer fan, Raj. I don't know that he's right for this series, but maybe you can get him on Men and Blazers and check in. We soccer fans, me and Kissinger, we are the worst. But that <laughs> tournament had unwittingly become a corrupt government's last desperate attempt to try and project a sense of international legitimacy. The generals of that military junta set about the task with just a sinister abandon. An admiral, Carlos Alberto Lacoste, was selected to prepare the nation for the tournament, and he inherited that role after his predecessor, let's just say mysteriously, was assassinated in the days ahead of his very first press conference. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> Roads were built across the country, massive stadia constructed. Their seating capacities were occasionally larger than the population of the towns where they were located. Slums swept to their inhabitants, thousands of whom, as you mentioned, were then disappeared. And it was an American PR company that led all the spin globally on this effort. I mean, this is truly disgusting. It was a company called Burson Marsteller, still one of the biggest PR firms in the world, though in 2018 they merged with another giant PR firm and changed their name. But, you know, unfortunately, a name change can't erase the history and the fact that despite widespread reports of human rights violations in Argentina, Burson Marsteller still went ahead and they pitched the military junta on a plan to, quote, project a new progressive and stable image throughout the world. That is just an incredible sentence you've just uttered. You can imagine these Americans in just like their <laughs> Brooks Brothers suits and mm-hmm. ties. But like, look, yep, yeah, we know, we know you're a military hunter, but we've got a plan. Would you like to project a new progressive and stable image to the world? Here's how. What a, what a lovely quote. And unfortunately, American banks were lending the money. I mean, we are, we are thick in this thing here in the United States. But Raj, no surprise <laughs> that the Burson team focused a lot of their time in the lead up to the tournament on trying to rebut negative stories about human rights abuses in Argentina and working to counteract growing calls in Europe to boycott the World Cup, which frankly were gaining some steam. There were murmurs, I do remember this, in the run-up of political protests across the soccer world. The English Union of Journalists, God bless them, provided its members with a Spanish-language handbook to prepare them for the tournament, one that included such phrases as, stop torturing me, I crap you not. But once the tournament began, the soccer took over. This is what happens. You know, we fear, we panic, we ask questions, but the football kicks off. And I remember when Argentina won, the streets were flooded with people who cheered the generals as they stood on the balcony of their presidential palace. They took in the acclaim of their nation. They had this newfound swarming popularity. And do you know what they did with that newfound popularity, Tommy? Mm, they invaded part of Chile. At least it had an adorable name, Roger. It was called the, the Beagle Conflict. That's Was cute. it really? Mm-hmm. Isn't that sweet? I can't say 100% sure that Burston were involved in the naming <laughs> of that war. But they're probably like, guys, people hate wars, but they love, they love puppies. <laughs> Support for this podcast comes from Wise, the universal account that lets you send, spend, and receive money internationally. With one account for over 50 currencies, who exactly is Wise made for? It's made for Austrians at routing to Australia, Swedes safaring in South Africa, football clubs who overspend on aging past their prime strikers named Solomon Rondon. Now, Raj, I'm, I'm relatively new to soccer here, but it does not take a tactical genius to figure out that Solomon Rondon is not the answer. Rondon, not the answer, but Wise is. Wise is made for people without borders, people who believe that using your money should be easy, even if life gets complicated. You see, with Wise, you always get the real exchange rate with no markups, no hidden fees. They help you save on currency conversion. Wherever your money takes you, Wise is the account that's made for the world. Join 13 million customers and counting and learn how the Wise account could work for you at wise.com slash crooked world. Talking to countries that host World Cups and then immediately proceed to engage in horrific territorial disputes. That brings us almost to the present day. Russia 2018, a tournament conducted. It really was via the baton of Vladimir Putin. A gent who just ripped a page right on Mussolini's book whenever he could in terms of the horseback riding. Only he doubles down, likes to do it shirtless. Yeah. And another lover of sports 
the gentleman who scores six goals in a hockey game that's filled with former professionals, other than a rising NHL prospect, Tommy, even before he had invaded Ukraine. Can you give us an idea of life under Putin in Russia? Look, there was no political space. Putin silences dissent. He shuts down independent media so that Russians only hear propaganda that comes from state-run outlets. And he locks up political opponents who might actually threaten his rule. And like I mentioned earlier, I mean, Russia is a kleptocracy. It is corrupt from top to bottom. And Putin uses events like the World Cup or the Sochi Olympics in 2014 to give contracts for infrastructure projects to his buddies who then siphon off billions of dollars in state funds, billions of dollars. One stadium in St. Petersburg, you might have seen it, Raj, the Krestovsky Stadium, was completed eight years late and 540% over budget. That is it's literally a monument to corruption. It's like the Boston big dig for FIFA. Only 540% <laughs> Only. over budget. I mean, we could go on when it comes to this tournament. Again, an autocrat's World Cup playbook, pre-tournament crackdowns on dissidents across the country. And I will say, Tommy, I went to that World Cup with my producer, J-Dubs, and we saw what was happening. And we actually talked about it at the time on the Men in Blazers podcast. I'll be honest, I was last in Moscow <laughs> 10 years ago. The monument, the history, the dark history, the deep history of suffering, of pain, of human inflicted ideas, they seep through 10 years ago. Not now, mate. This place is gussied up. I don't know what they've done to their stray dogs. They seem to have got every beautiful man and woman in the whole of the former Soviet Republic and dumped them into like the five square miles around the Kremlin. Because if you go further than that, it's like a very different Russia. And looking back on it, even though we kind of, listening to that clip, saw it for what it was and called it out, we were still amongst thousands of journalists who poured into Russia and essentially did Putin's bidding. We put pictures of ourselves on the television, having a blast, you know, on Instagram, social media, in the bars, running around the subways, those beautiful subways. And most importantly for Putin, at the bloody football games all over social media. And I'll tell you, one thing I remember, we went to watch Brazil versus Serbia at Spartak's Moscow Stadium, just outside of the capital city. And as soon as we walked in, we were like, oh my God, the Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi is incredible because, you know, sporting events or concerts. They're probably not true with the Russian public library. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you go public library or you go to most American sporting events and you are pretty well guaranteed to be getting zero bars, WTF. And this was the antithesis of that. The internet was incredible all game. And I remember, I've got to find the clip of this because I actually filmed him filming himself. There was an incredible Brazilian fan, totally intoxicated in front of us. Picture in your imagination, essentially Sao Paulo Ronnie from Jersey Shore. <laughs> and this gen had, had travelled all the way to Russia from Brazil and spent the entirety of the game WhatsApping oh every single name methodically in his address book. Just the same conversation over and over again. He didn't watch a second of the actual game <laughs> that he traveled there to watch. But watching him, I was like, oh my God, this... This is exactly what Putin wanted. Yeah. Just images being back to countries around the world, showing everyone what an incredible time they were missing out on in Russia, beautiful Russia. And ahead of that 2018 World Cup final, current FIFA president, Johnny Infantino, he stepped up and said, We all fell in love with Russia. All of us, everyone who has been here for a period of time now has discovered a country that uh, we didn't know. Putin being by the World Cup, that optic, that massive PR win. And he went on to thank Infantino for your glowing assessment of our efforts and presented him with an Order of Friendship medal at the Kremlin in May 2019. This is Russia. Gross. This is FIFA. And by the way, that medal, Infantino has constantly refused to return despite the Ukraine invasion. Tommy, Juvenile said it best, I believe. Give them bread and circuses and they will never revolt. That's really what this is, right? I mean, you worked in government. Talk to us a little bit about this age-old policy. Yeah, I mean, listen, so in Putin's case, I mean, and he said this pretty clearly, he wants to restore the glory of the Soviet Union. He wants Russia to be seen as powerful and respected and a dominant force on the global stage with himself basking 
shirtless on the horse at the center of all of the action. <laughs> and, and that's why Putin will bribe whoever it takes to get the World Cup or to get the Olympics. You know, that's why Russia had a, a state-run doping program, so that their roided-up athletes would rack up gold medals, right? I mean, but it's not just Putin. Nearly every political leader, to some extent, wants their people happy. I say nearly every because I'm not sure the North Koreans do. But they want to, all want to look powerful and in control. And that's why countries and cities compete to host the World Cup or to host the Olympic Games, even though the economic impact is far from guaranteed to be positive, and in many cases has left cities and countries deep in debt. But the glory, Raj, the glory of being in the center of all that action, being oh. seen as having delivered for your country, that lasts forever. I mean, Mitt Romney ran for president in part based off of his experience running the Salt Lake City Olympic Games. In 2009, my boss, Barack Obama, traveled all the way to Copenhagen in the middle of the Obamacare fight, right? We were in the depths of a congressional battle to personally address the International Olympic Committee in an effort to bring the Olympic Games home to Chicago. And Raj, I don't know if you remember, but that effort did not go so well. It might have failed. Miserably. We didn't. We didn't bribe enough, is my sense. But look, the guy made the trip. You can never bribe enough. <laughs> is the first rule for any autocrat who's listening to this podcast. But when you talk about all this, when it comes to sport, the problem about what we do now, armed with all this insight, is that sports is always a bloody emotional release. That's what we said earlier. It's a joy a refuge, a place we seek shelter from the storm of everyday life. I can't tell you the joy during the pandemic when football came back in Germany to begin with, even fanless, just that sense of global connection we all felt again, that diversion, that sense of, of shared meaning. And once a ball's been kicked, we're no longer furious about autocrats. We're no longer thinking about infrastructure. We're no longer thinking about corruption. No, we're watching for Messi, transcendence for Alex Morgan, for Christian Pulisic, we're not sitting there and analyzing soft power <laughs> and protesting against it. But right now, we really are. We're at a crossroads, a crossroads we arguably arrived at a long time ago. But the awarding of this World Cup to Qatar it was so craven. It was so brazen. The emotional joy of sport couldn't sweep away the rationale of what we were confronted with by this tournament, by this World Cup, Tommy. I'm excited to watch. I will love every minute of the games, but it is hard not to feel like that joy is tempered by my knowledge of the reality of life in Qatar. I mean, th there's a great organization, Raj, called Freedom House. They score every country in the world based on their citizens' access to political rights and civil liberties. It's called your global freedom score. Syria got a one. No bueno. Sweden got 100. <laughs> the U.S. got, we got like an 83. We're like, a, we're like in that B, B minus zone. Whoa, bite your arm off for an 83. <laughs> we're feeling good, good. Qatar got a 25. So not the worst in the world, but pretty bad. And like life is far worse if you're a woman or intolerable if you're gay. But, you know, the really ugly thing that we all need to confront as we watch these games is the treatment of foreign workers in Qatar. Because those stadiums we're watching, these games get played in, these foreign workers are the ones who built them. They're the ones who built the new roads. They built all the infrastructure associated with the World Cup. These are the people, if you get to go to the games, who are cleaning your hotel or staffing the restaurant that you're eating at. And last year, The Guardian reported that 6,500 migrant workers have died in Qatar since it won its World Cup bid. That is devastating. That is hard to move on from. I woke up, there was only one by Qatar, corruptly given to them by football's governing body. And they clearly, they clearly at this point, we just know from the investigations, the myriad of them around the world, they did not win the right to host this tournament on merit. It happened in a fashion that was honestly thought impossible. But they did it. Coffers were filled. Even a ton of Airbus A320. I don't know what the plural of that is. Is it Airbuses? Is it Airby? Were ordered by <laughs> Qatar from a French production plant in Toulouse. And that was enough to encourage then French President Nicolas Sarkozy to step in and influence where and how his nation voted. And that's it. It's pretty stark. Football will occur in a place where workers have lost their lives to build those stadia, those fields, those terraces for our viewing delight. And we know all of these things. 
But the thing we don't know is what do we all do now? We've seen some international federations start to respond and we will no doubt see more as the clock ticks down to kick off in Qatar. And we'll get to all of that in detail in future episodes. But what we don't know yet is how fans will respond. What we as sports fans, that's the thing that if you've gotten to this point, most of us probably share we are all sports fans. What are we going to do? How will we consume what is essentially a World Cup soaked in blood? And we know we're not alone in the conundrum. It's not just us, Tommy V, me, and Johnny Oliver. You know, our mailbag at meninblazers at gmail.com nice plug. has been, did I say it? Meninblazers at gmail.com <laughs> has been flooded with emails we get daily calls on our phone hotline people asking how they can square this moral circle hey rods joe here from orlando florida curious what your thoughts are on watching the world cup given all the circumstances surrounding you know qatar and how it was awarded especially with the u.s men's national team participating and the reality is there is no simple answer to this dilemma and so we're going to explore it together, dear listener. Tommy V, myself and you, we're going to trace how this game of football, this beautiful, beautiful game of football, a game that gives me so much joy with its working class roots, its history, has been transformed in England. Yes, it's become a glitzy bauble. How did a game that fills us with so much meaning on the field become soiled and run? and soiled some more by the most craven <laughs> set of self-dealing, grotesque suits since Waystar Roykek. Do not talk about Kendall Roy that way. He is misunderstood. They are the football team on the show. <laughs> oh, God. The bigger question is, why would they even want it? You know, why do these countries want the games when they have none of the infrastructure, when they don't have the right climate, when they know all of a sudden we're going to be talking about their human rights record to the extent that you and I are right now? And ultimately, the question we really hope to answer is how should we together as fans find a position so that we can handle all of it? How do we think through it? Do we think through it at all? Because that's also a position. What individual positions are we going to be able to find to work our way through? That last episode is just you and me literally shoving our heads in the sand. <laughs> that's how this thing ends. No, I'm just kidding. Of course, Raj, I could not be more excited to be a part of this, to talk through all my, my layers of grief and anxiety about football, about sports, about life with you, with the listeners. So thank you. It's going to be some journey, Tommy V. We are just at the beginning. I'm going to close this pod the way I close so bloody many men in blazers pods by saying one word, courage, because we're going to need a lot of it. <laughs>